September 2022 and the start of the Torino-Nice Rally. This has been called Europe's best bikepacking route and this is the full story of my ride. I've previously released some of this journey as a series of short videos. Here I not only pull them all together, I add a lot more material from before and during my Torino-Nice Rally ride in the hope it's useful to others who plan to tackle this excellent event even though I didn't start with everyone else. And this is the official start point of the Turin-Nice Rally. Tomorrow there will be more than a hundred riders here for the off. Today it's just me. This feels like the Italian job when there's one route out of Turin and you have to find it. This is where we're headed, a series of rough gravel roads blasted into the high Alps by the Italian military, most over 2,000 meters high. There's not one route for the Torino-Nice Rally. We each have to make a series of choices along the way based on our abilities and accumulated fatigue. We link the gravel roads together by tackling famous road climbs over classic cols and we'll flit between Italy and France. Oh my word. Although this is somewhere I shouldn't really be. A closed road known fondly as the death road due to the risk of rockfall that is reclaiming it for nature. Overnights are in mountain refuges, tents and bivouacs. And the 700 kilometer route can take anything from five to 10 days. All that lies ahead, but let's go back to how I got here. This is one of my local rides in the Scottish Highlands. Distance, cost, time and doubt over a knee injury persuaded me to fly rather than sit a long time on a coach or train. I packed my bike box for a direct flight from Edinburgh to Nice. I left it at an airport hotel and set out for Turin. The easiest way is a direct coach called a Flixbus that takes bikes, but there were no spaces. So my first hop was to a town in Italy. I know when you're doing these things, you're meant to put on a brave face that nothing can faze you. But I have to say this morning, I've had such a tightness in my chest. Heart rate's been well over a hundred and I'm sure it's all to do with the, the stress of traveling combined with dehydration. Oh my word, yeah, okay. There's no way I'm getting on there. Early trains were really crowded with no bike space left, despite my reservation, but I got there eventually. Early the next morning, I was on a different Flixbus route to Turin. It's a great city to explore and allow my heart rate to return to normal after all the traveling. I decided to leave a day early because shooting video slows down my cycling and I wanted to be in the higher mountains when other riders caught up to me. It's time to introduce you to my companion. This is Rosie and she is a clanger. If you're not sure what that is, Google it and you'll find a 1970s television program. She's used to expeditions. She traveled, hiked the length of the United States from Mexico to Canada, which is well over two and a half thousand miles. That was 20 years ago and she must have felt the need to come on another big trip, as did I. Coming into Lanzo, the first real sort of landmark on the route, and it feels what it is. It feels a gateway town to the big mountains. That running water is a good sign. Hopefully there'll be plenty more of it ahead. A little way into the climb, I face my first route decision. So this is the choice point. Either you go down that way and climb over the Col de Lys, which is lower and generally easier because it's road coal, or head up this way and go over the off-road Colombardo, which is the way I'm going. After the dead straight approach to the mountains, the Colombardo is a brute. Broken tarmac becomes loose gravel to the 1800 meter col, then the TNR goes higher still. I'm kidding about this. It's like riding up a wall. Ah. Looks like this is where it, looks like this is where it gets serious. Oh my god, that was the easy bit. <laughs> Oh, 
right, well that feels like the top of the Columbardo. That's, let me stop. Top of the Columbardo, that is eight hours. Yeah, eight hours after leaving Turin this morning, including stops. You'll do it faster. Alone, over 2,000 meters high, on my first day of riding, this feels a very lonely, exposed place. Well, I'm hoping that this really does mark the top of whatever I have been riding over. I'd been aiming for the Col de Colombard because I thought that was the top. Turns out this is another 200 meters, almost past that. But this is the right way, so fingers crossed it's downhill from here. I'll be ready for my dinner. This is the pattern when cycling in the Alps. Hours to climb up, minutes to ride down. Even when you get caught in a traffic jam. I've arranged a hotel with good food for my first night because tomorrow will be even harder. Day two, and I'm not entirely sure I could do another day like that. We'll find out, the bike's been safe overnight. Really nice having a place to aim for. And if you think this is quite a well-loaded bike, as in a lot of stuff, all of this stayed out last night. That is all camping gear I didn't need. That is all stuff for on the bike and a bit of camping gear. That's all I had to take into the hotel for dinner. So if I was credit carding, I would go with this and those things, and that'd be it. I have found myself in the middle of a German motor rally. <sighs> I'm smiling, but I'm getting hardly sick of them. Oh, each to their own. You gotta live and let live. I hoped the gravel would deter them, but no. Motorbikes, four wheel drives, and normal cars over 20 years old, about 150 of them, I was later told. I'm trying to be all live and let live, but to be honest, it is getting quite tedious, this. At least the four wheel drive people. Yeah, unlike those who pass with millimeters, the four wheel drive people know to hang back, give me a bit of space. The other guys in their little classic cars, they just barrel on through, no matter how close they are. Nice Mustang, wrong place. <laughs> that so many vehicles shared this and the gravel roads ahead was an unpleasant surprise. Of course, if I hadn't started a day early, I would not have met this rally. I focused on the scenery and the cycling, which is outstanding. <laughs> I do believe that's the summit. Good choice. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm no, best good. It's cold. What tonight? Is it cold? It's, it's, it's cold. It's cold. Yeah. Oh, I'll have a Coke. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's very kind. The cars have to be 20 years old. Uh, we don't use any GPS or navigation, just old school paper based maps, uh, as well as no, no highways or Autobahn, how we call it in Germany. And we started like four days ago in Salzburg in Austria. And then we have the finish line tomorrow night at uh, Saint Tropez area. As part of their rally, they have to fulfill a daft challenge every, every day. The crew does. And today's is ride a bicycle at over 2,000 meters. So, I should sell these. From the motor chaos of the Col de Finstre, my high point will be the Col de la Sieta. And after that, my overnight objective, Casa Asieta, the first of three refuges I'll use. Sadly, I still have motorized company. This is the start of the Strada Asieta, the first of the spectacular Italian military roads that are the centerpiece of the Torino-Nice rally. Judging by the gathering of metal up here, this is probably the Col d'Asieta. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Merci tout le monde.
Est-ce que vous avez une place pour une personne pour dormir ce soir Non. Non D'accord. Euh, pour manger No rooms, but I can eat here at half past seven and I can camp here. Oh, I'm really undecided. I think I might stay here, although I would like to get on a bit. I had a major dither before I decided what to do here, you know, but in fact, I started to leave. I came back and said to the guy, look, I'm sorry, I'm being an idiot. It's far more sensible if I stay here because it's going to be night when I hit Sestrie. This is the right call. Strada Assieta. Built in the 1800s by and for the military, it rises and falls over several cols, all over 2,000 meters. It's only open June to October, and first thing in the morning, it is spectacular. It's just a glorious place to be. Look at that. <laughs> thing that I have got wrong I think is I only brought one pair of bibs and I washed these too late to get them dry on the heater I thought it was staying on all night and it didn't so these are still quite damp and I'm not sure what to do they're not drying on the front of the bike they could get all gravelly so I'm actually going to put them on over my tights in the hope that that works otherwise just, of course I might just end up with two lots of wet stuff that was definitely the right decision to spend the night at Casa Asieta. Not only did I get that fantastic morning light, but there's still quite a lot of climbing and descending to do. I'm only now at the top of the, uh, the main descent and that's two and a half hours. I have been taking a lot of pictures, but still, I would not have liked to have done that last night because it would have mean I've been going down here in the dark. Well, someone's going well. Yeah. Some of the faster TNR riders have caught me. Oh, all good. Yeah, Simon, isn't it? It is. Hi. Who are you? Yeah. Sorry, which way? I'm good. Yeah. What's your name? Freddy. Ah, oh, Freddy. Hi. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. Good. And that's what most encounters are like. The ski resort of Sestrier flew past before more superb downhill gravel, and then rode. The same team caught me up on the next climb. I hung on for a while until it was too rich for me. Bonjour. The border with France came and went. That's the call. See if I can find what I need. And after stocking up in Briançon, it was onto the classic Col d'Isoard. 12.45. That's nothing. Well, all the TNR riders will tackle the lower slopes of the Col d'Isoard. There's a village part way up where we have to make a choice. And there's a certain moral pressure to not go up the, the road col, but to go over something called the Col de Peas, which is much more challenging and was pioneered by someone whose spirit embodies the TNR. Fred Wright pioneered the rough stuff approach to alpine cycling, much of it walking with a bike. Recently republished is his original guidebook, although the first edition was more of a set of photocopied notes. No fat tyres or suspension forks here. Ladders were no obstacle. If Fred had ridden the TNR, he would undoubtedly have taken the Col de Pise route, despite or because of the bike carry that was involved. Looking back, I wish I had. But I wanted to take off the classic road climb that has featured so prominently in the history of the Tour de France. Six p.m. and I'm just riding up the Isoard, hoping something's going to turn up. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm not alone. Have you made kind of uh, preparation videos on YouTube yeah. about this whole thing? Oh, yeah but I'm panting too much to speak. Yet Obi can do this. Well done, Obi. Oh, bloody hell, that's very impressive. Oh, 
and there we have the summit of the Col des Oies. Oh, where's the water when you want it? It's a great spot, but you'll understand if I don't spend a lot of time doing video uh, because really I need to get down. There's a cold wind blowing up there and I need to be down and in the trees and get myself some shelter to get my tent up. Okay, two picnic tables together. This looks promising. I suspect this area is going to be far from ideal because it looks rock hard and I'll not get my pegs in. But any lower and I'm going to be in amongst the meadows. We uh, can see them very close. So I think I'm just going to have to make this work one way or another. Some things are working well, some things less so. The Rab Neutrino 200 sleeping bag is ideal. I wouldn't have wanted the 400, the 200 has been perfect for these weather conditions, uh, as long as I had a down jacket to wear inside. I actually kept this on last night because it was, it was quite wet and I had to get out and sort the tent, but the tent has stood up to everything actually. Uh, it's the Terra Nova. It has been an ideal mountain tent and the size it packs down to is ideal. Finding great places for breakfast is one of the delights of cycle touring. And I'll need it to tackle the highest point on the TNR. Hey, hello, hello. And see you somewhere later on. Yet another adventure. That's the one. Just a quick word about weather apps I found the Norwegian one, YR, had most places in it, including coals. So I was using, using that a lot to work out the temperatures to know what sleeping bag to bring. So that was handy before I got here. Actually on the route, Weather Underground has a really good uh, rainfall radar. I thought it was wrong last night because there was no wind. And yet, sure enough, thunderstorm short sharp heavy rain and according to it there's some rain just across these mountains here so i want to get up and over the agnel before the lightning arrives last night i realized i had a sore backside and this morning i found it's got open skin and the saddle on that rough stuff has dropped oh well over a centimeter so that would have explained why I've got this sore, I'm really going to have to keep an eye on it. <laughs> Ciao. 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 If you want to swap bikes for the last 4k, I'm up for it. <laughs> Almost there. Well, I hope. 3K. See you at the top? Yeah. Fusion Cafe, Grand Cafe Olay. And the good news is, I was a bit worried about tonight because it's going to be very wet. And two nights in a tent. My backside playing me up. Um, Liz had a hunt around on booking.com. She says, I can get you a room. And show, what was showing for my booking.com last night was that there were no rooms left in Saint Père. So some must have just been released and I managed to get a single room, uh, not too expensive either. So sorry, Camping David, it's going to be the single room. No more, is there? This is the top, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> oh yes, good. Thankfully, the, the campsite. Yeah, I was, I was just in the refuge down there, and they were emphasizing again about the storms that are coming in. Yeah, yeah I that's think the reason I don't want to sleep in the bivy bag, I think. Three o'clock, apparently. So, see you guys for Instagram. Not yeah. me, just a, just a bike. So what do you think? I should just put the camera here, 
go down, ride all that, then come back up again to pick up the camera. Storms are forecast, so there's no hanging around. We're shooting down the valley. Many riders are heading to a hotel, me included, looking forward to what tomorrow will bring. How are you? Okay, I'm getting there. Good. Such a nice morning. How are you finding this route? Is it what you expected? Much more difficult than what I expected, actually. But it's fine. I mean, we take uh, our time. Hopefully, we have good weather, so yeah. it's, it's all fine. I think I, I feel exactly the same as you, yeah. and I think a lot of people do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, wow, this really is tough, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I don't know how to train about it because yeah. I mean, you need uh, 3,000 meters every day. It's... Is this harder than you thought it might be? Uh, to be honest, yes, but that's also why I, I have a little cold. Oh. More difficult still when you're camping high, having forgotten your sleeping mat. It was kind of okay. I think I slept maybe four hours. So next day was still probably adrenaline of the whole yeah. <laughs> thing getting me up. But I'm not looking forward to the next baby space if I can't find a mattress. This call is a key decision point with at least two possible alternative routes, hence the discussions. The approved of way is the Strada Canone. I think that's the Cannon Road. But by all accounts, that's more mountain bike than it is gravel with, with baby head sized rocks. Uh, the alternative is the Vallon de Ever, um, which is very much disapproved of. It is colloquially known as the Death Road. Who has decided to do the Death Road? Because there was an awful lot of discussion. Yes? Yes, burnt is as well. Honestly, a name like the Death Road, that is catnip to an adventure cyclist. No choice really for me. Hello. And this is where the story really starts. Ave Maria. It's a rockfall tunnel and it looks a oh my word, yeah. Ooh. This section of road is closed and in the process of being reclaimed by nature. Bombardment by rockfall, which is most prevalent after rain, has wrecked those railings and cratered the carriageway. I mean, look at that. They're gonna give way, aren't they? I really do not want this video to encourage people to come this way. Any one of those millions of rocks could not only end your ride, it could end your life. I am only here because it's dry, sunny, and the rock is relatively stable. If it had been raining here this morning, I would not want to be here at all. Some riders were fined at the bottom for riding a closed road, although they weren't clear if it was really the police or some kind of a scam. I'm just going to keep clear here just in case I've done the wrong thing there and uh, head over this way. To reach the Gardetta Refuge, there are two routes. This long way involves an extremely challenging hiker-bike section. Easier is a road ride up the Col Priet, followed by an off-road section, and this is the route I took. Along with quite a few others, it seems. Oh, done. Seems a bit harsh. <laughs> Keeping him fit, I guess. On this occasion today, the top of the road coal is not the top of the climbing. And we're off road now. My legs haven't got it in them to not push. 
Here we go again, riding into the night. Hope you're gonna make it somewhere in time before it gets dark. Do you know what? I think this might be it. Fugio Gardetta. Well, I've heard so much about it. Let's see if it lives up to the hype. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah. <laughs> Here? Okay. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Only one person got a good night's sleep in that dorm. This is exactly what I came for. It's how I envisaged the Torino Nice Rally. Rideable gravel over 2,000 meters high in the Italian Alps. Early morning, it is still traffic free. It's the Altiplano della Gardetta and is known to TNR riders as Little Peru, a name given to it by the TNR founder, James Olson. Most riders with whom I was at the Gardetta last night are going to ride through to the Don Barbera refuge. I'm going to split that journey over two days, uh, partly because I want shorter days, partly because no one has ever come back and said, oh, I wish I'd ridden that trip faster. They all say, I wish I'd ridden it slower. And also my backside just needs some time to recover. It's gone a bit nasty again. All morning I've been having these slightly weird, almost out-of-body experiences. The sense of place here, above 2,000 meters, is almost overwhelming. It's almost as if all this isn't real. I keep thinking, am I here? Is this happening? As a consequence, I've fallen well behind everybody else, but it doesn't matter. It's just so awe-inspiring. And the riding, my goodness. God, it's good. Don't get the impression it's all easy gravel cruising. It is not. Much of it is too steep, too loose, or too bouldery for me, at least, to ride. It came to an end at a road call, and by now I knew the routine. A fast descent, some nice towns and villages, some less nice industrial areas and big roads. It's kind of hard to believe that this is the same day. Started high on the Altiplano, ending up here in quite an industrial valley. Weirdly, a town dedicated to Pinocchio, the illustrator of the stories, was born here. Breaking my journey in a lovely mountain town, ready for the next climb into open space. Now this really is weird. Ciao. Ciao. I'd expected to see lots of people out on the road early Saturday while climbing the Col de Tende, but not this many at the top. Where were they all going? What was happening? Why a polenta party for 200 in a ruined fort? It seems the National Park was celebrating completing repairs to footpaths damaged by Storm Alex. The woman, who I asked, just happened to be the head of the National Park. And we have uh, uh, promoted this uh, kind of uh, uh, tourism attraction, but it's not on biking, it's no, just walking. No, just walking, yeah. just walking. Yeah. Well, but great, thank you very much. It was a big surprise, it was a very nice surprise. Let's slow down. The Salt Road runs 30 kilometers through the mountains, mostly over 2,000 meters, 
and cyclists pay one euro toll. One bike. How many today, people, cars? 80, 85 uh, bike and uh, 40 so auto. 80, 80 motorbike. 80 motorbike, cars. This is what I came for. This is what we come for. Places like this. Via del Salo, this could just mean a, a way, but it's really well built. You've got barriers here, so it clearly was something of a road at some time. And if you look down here, there are even curbstones after a fashion. So yeah, this actually was a proper road. Well, proper-ish. It was built in the Middle Ages to transport salt from the coast to the Alpine towns and on to Turin. The military enlarged and improved it for troop movements, building forts along its length. There's a military building here in 1931 for the 1st Alpine Regiment. It's only open in summer and is closed to motorised traffic Tuesdays and Thursdays. Clearly, Saturday afternoon is exactly the wrong time to cycle it. Just wait to get to a passing place! I'm not pleased at how I reacted there, because most motorists were patient. So, refuge tonight? Um, we'll probably keep going. Okay. Well, All we'll right. Let me have a dinner there. Yeah. And then we'll probably keep going. Yeah. Just by the just there. Just there. Right, well, I'm going to go and put my tent up. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave you, dog. Apparently the uh, the hut is packed tonight because they've got this e-bike event on. So camping outside and having dinner and breakfast in there seems the ideal option for me. My friend, you have to go to the Via del Sale because uh, you can find good people, good food and beautiful places and the landscapes. So you have to do it. <laughs> Instant friendships happen in huts, but at busy times, with packed dormitories, camped outside is the only place to sleep. Today is my last day among the giants. The Via del Sale continues to rise and fall. The loose boulders seem easier to negotiate without the threat of motor vehicles, whose drivers seem thankfully averse to early mornings. Karen springs a puncture. Most TNR riders run tubeless. I used a mix of butyl and tubulito tubes and never punctured once, but I was probably slower on descents. A last climb, which is tough, then a final challenging descent, popular with e-mountain bikers. Wow. This is what you need, Joe. I don't know if you can see over my handlebars, but it's a bit like going downstairs sometimes. I have the strangest sensation on this descent that something is coming to an end and I think it's the high mountains, even though there's two days left. The next top, for me, will not be up there in the places that I've loved. Most riders speed past this amazing small chapel. It prepared me for the chaos of re-entry to the real world. It's a bit odd because today, so I'm skipping out a call, today is going to be a short day, and yet Commute has it just under six hours. It's really weird that that's a short ride. And I'm not actually sure what it's going to be like. I think it's going to be pretty grotty road all the way. But you never know, could be brilliant. So, fingers crossed.
The scale of the repairs reflects the scale of devastation Storm Alex wrought on the Roya Valley. Homes, bridges and roads washed away. Ten dead, eight still missing. Graves swept downstream with bodies found on Italian beaches. Two years on, the work continues. Climbing now, the lower altitude and much nearer the coast, the vegetation is quite different. The pine trees of the mountains have gone. We've got lots of olive trees. And I'm taking a shortcut. There's a gravel climb to the Col Turini, but I'm missing that out in favor of a road climb over the Col de Bruis. In Sospel, I'll rejoin the main route, but there is no must-do route for this ride. Sospel turns out to be a lovely tourist town, so I'm not exactly hurrying. Stocked up with a few food items for the last night camped on the TNR. What did I like and dislike about the TNR? I liked the high places. I did not expect to encounter so much traffic. I don't know why, possibly because I haven't ridden those sort of trails in the Alps. It's hard. It's actually a damn sight harder than I expected, but there's no way to prepare for it. But it's been a great experience. It looks amazing, but what I want to get across to you is it smells amazing. You know when I said Col de Braus was the last call? It wasn't. Col de la Madone, where Trek gets its name for the Madone bike from. It's a legendary climb at 922 meters, but after the last week, it barely registers as a lump. The descent is excellent. This is road bike territory, and there are lots of them around. A bit lean, these boys. It's also time to start tangling with traffic again. Oh. Oh, Might have to wash my shorts now. <laughs> my ride was about 400 miles. That's 650 kilometers but distance is not the main factor on the Torino-Nice rally. Yeah, Simon, isn't it? It is. Hey. It's the climbing around 50,000 feet or 15,000 meters and the rough, challenging surfaces. I deliberately slowed and took 10 days. Some riders managed it in just six. If you want to swap bikes for the last 4K, I'm up for it. <laughs> If you're looking for a similar adventure, check out the Rome Scotland Rally, which is based on the TNR. Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I have lots of video resources, including an interview with James Olson, the TNR founder, who has loads of tips. I have a series showing how I prepared for my ride, plus a couple of videos afterwards going through what worked and what didn't. There are also one minute videos posted daily from my ride. You'll find all of these in this playlist. Click it and then scroll down until you find the one that interests you most. Until next time, goodbye. Yeah,